Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Roundabout Sports, presented by Interstate 70 Sports Media, where our passion is our profession. My name's Jeremy Karp. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. First, I also want to give a special shout out to James Knox for his work um, last night, his Knox's Corner. He's, he's our new insider, our new team member, and I'm so grateful for everything he has done so far. Um, so before we get started, first I got to tell you, we have a great show tonight. We got Luke Roberts, who's been in the professional wrestling industry for nearly 35 years. He's a dear friend, and on top of that, if it were not for him, I would not be where I'm at today. And I could never stress that enough. Um, later on, we're going to actually have Parker Bania on. And Parker is a sports historian. He's a published author. And he has so much detail to everything he writes and talks about. So he's definitely going to be very informative for us. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Before we get started, though, there is something I want to do. Um, you know, normally, like I said, we do the shows Wednesday night. Um, and trust me, next week, we'll get back to doing that. But I think it's very coincidental that we're doing the show on Thursday night this week because it's March 3rd, and March 3rd is actually my dad's birthday. And so, and for those that don't know, that's my dad. And so, I don't mind keeping this picture up for a second. Uh, he's a stylish looking guy. He's a stomach cancer survivor, and he's one of the nicest, most caring guys, loyal, immature. He's literally a, <laughs> he's like the equivalent of dealing with a 12 year old sometimes. He's just so much fun. Like, we, it, I, I can't describe how amazing he is. And I love him to death. So, Dad, I know you're watching, I know you're having a good vacation. <laughs> Um, so happy birthday, and I can't wait to see you soon. Um, with that, like I said, we have an amazing show tonight. Um, last night, James had talked a lot about the MLB lockout, so we're not going to really delve into much of that tonight as it still rages on. Basically, it's turned into a war between the players and the owners, and we'll see how well that continues. And we know at least the first two series are canceled for the season. Um, that said, I mean, folks, like I, like I said earlier, I have to introduce this guy in the best way possible. I mean, what can I say about Luke Roberts that, um, hasn't already been said by somebody else? He knows the who's who of professional wrestling. He's been doing this practically his entire adult life. Wrestling's in his blood. Whether it be as a wrestler, a referee, a broadcaster, a media relations director, he's done it all and he knows all. And, you know, I could not be any more grateful to call him a friend and a confidant. So, ladies and gentlemen, from Dynamo Pro Wrestling, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Luke Roberts. Well, Jeremy, I got to tell you right now, I, I don't know how I can follow such a great introduction. Um, first of all, thank you for having me on the program tonight. Roundabout Sports is, like I said, it's it's taking off. Uh, Interstate 70 Sports Media is taking off as well. And again, we're going to have a great show tonight. I want to hear about this Major League Baseball stuff because, I mean, I always get kind of sad because now with everything going on between the Players Association and Major League Baseball, I'm not going to fib. This may get some, some viewers right off the bat kind of fired up, but I'm a Cubs fan, but the idea for those first two series being being canceled and possibly more, the idea of not seeing the Cubs come to St. Louis and play in one of the most landmark series every year, this tick, one of the most in-demand tickets in St. Louis when you see the Cardinals and Cubs play each other at Bush Stadium. It's disappointing, but, I mean, again, it's one of those hopefully they yeah. get it worked out and we can we can see some baseball yet this season. I, ho I really hope so, and like I said, that's one of the – Great things about having um, James Knox on our team. He He's keeping so much track of it every day. He's given me so much breaking news that, you know, guys like Adam and I would not have been able to find out without him. Um, so I'm so grateful. And But how are you doing, Luke? 
Oh, I'm, I'm doing wonderful. I mean, again, I do have to share a little story. I mean, again, I know you talked earlier about your dad's birthday and happy birthday, by the way, and, and many, many more still to come. Uh, I remember last week uh, I had the opportunity for Jeremy and I to be in the uh, broadcast booth at Dynamo Pro Wrestling's Mardi Gras uh, event, uh, Mardi Gras Mischief. And um, Jeremy was talking about his dad's birthday and he was wanting to do something special for his dad. I mean, again, I hear constant stories about his dad and all the great times they've had. And like I said, it, it, it's not a privilege to know Jeremy and know his family. And, and again, happy birthday. This is This is one of those things where, Again, being in a, in a family with a cancer survivor, um, again, being a survivor of cancer is a very, uh, very, a very noticeable accomplishment. Again, unfortunately, it's not something that people want to go through, but to be a survivor and to be as active and, and, and again, I've, I've seen some moments where, where dad's gotten a little bit silly, a little bit, uh, or I would say a little bit humorous, I'd say a lot humorous, <laughs> but when it comes down to it, I mean, again, it's, it, it's a great opportunity to know you, Jeremy, and your family. And tonight's going to be a great show. Absolutely. So as I've mentioned before in promoting this episode and honestly just talking about you in general, professional wrestling and you have really been together for practically your entire adult life. Jeremy, I got to tell you, it definitely has been. Um, when I first started watching wrestling, I remember being – very, very young, four, five, six years old, being at my grandmother's house. And that was the big thing. My grandmother lived in Southern Missouri. And it was kind of an understatement that on Saturday night, by 5.05 Central Time, my mom and my dad and my grandma, they have dinner done. They had to have it on the TV trays. And they had to be ready to go to watch George Championship Wrestling, later World Championship Wrestling on WTBS. And it kind of it kind of grew on me from that point, and like I said, I had an opportunity. A lot of people don't get to see the independent level of like I had the opportunity to. I remember when I was in my late eight, nine, ten year old time period, and having the opportunity of going and seeing a lot of local events here in the St. Louis area, and seeing a lot of the men who would later become my mentors and a lot of my closest confidants in the professional wrestling industry, uh, guys like. John Blackheart, guys like Pete Madden, guys like the late Tony Costa, like Herb Simmons, like Ed Smith. I could go on. But the opportunity to see them all across the St. Louis area really kind of gave me that insight to be in professional wrestling, to want to be a part of it. And I feel very fortunate, not only for my career, but my brother had a, a pretty lengthy career inside the ropes. And my actually my nephew is currently active today down in the state of Tennessee. So, I mean, Professional wrestling definitely is in the, in the blood of the Roberts family. That is awesome. I don't even think I knew that your your nephew was a was active in the wrestling industry down in Tennessee. And you know, and even if I did, I'm so lost within all the stories you've shared with me over the years. Um, it it's just something so special. Now, you started your career as a professional wrestler. Um, who were you learning under the guidance of at that time? Well, I, I always say that when it comes to training to be a pro wrestler, by the time I actually got in the ring, I had already been around wrestling four or five years. I had been running sound. I had been uh, collecting ring jackets. I'd taken tickets in the past. I'd been selling merchandise. So by the time I got in the ring to actually start training, um, I got trained with my brother, and my brother was definitely one of those. It was really a unique style. I mean, I'm not a big guy. Never claimed to be. I know that. But my brother was a – I'll put it bluntly. He was a super heavyweight, but the man could move like a cruiserweight. And between him, uh, the Beast from the East, John Blackheart, and Pete Madden, both members of the independent uh, Midwest Independent Wrestling Hall of Fame, um, those three men, they didn't treat me – like I was a 15, 16 year old kid. They wanted me to be a professional wrestler. They wanted me to go in there and understand what it meant to climb inside those ropes and have that honor of being able to be inside the ring. And it, again, it was one of those two days a week. You hear a lot of people saying, Oh, I did this or I didn't. I was two days a week, every week for almost three years. And when I got in the ring, I mean, you, you've heard of sibling rivalry. Well, there was definitely some there because I mean, I was doing things in the ring that my own brother couldn't do. And my brother was doing things in the ring I couldn't do. And I was just watching the two of them. And 
And again, by the time we got in the ring, and we've had some, we had some battles inside the squared circle, but when it came down to it, I knew he was going to give me everything he had and vice versa. You know, when you talked about um, taking things like a, taking tickets, you know, working concessions and things of that nature, there's this thing in the wrestling industry that not everybody knows, but everybody should know, and it's called paying your dues. And you saw how I took that initiative from the very first Dynamo Pro show I did. You know, I wasn't, a lot of people have to be asked to do something and how, for example, I just went and started putting up chairs, but this involves putting up the ring before shows, taking down the ring after shows. And let me tell you, you know, as well as I do, and more than 90% of the people taking down those wrestling rings is hell. It is time consuming. <laughs> it is heavy work and it is hell because you have to get this stuff right when it comes to loading it all up. Yeah, it's it like I said, when it comes down to actually putting together a professional wrestling event, I mean, a lot of people think, oh, it's a trampoline. It bounces around like a trampoline. No, it's not. It's plywood and steel. It, it they're, they're, I think an average weight's about 2,500 pounds. And it's one of those things of where, I mean, again, putting everything together, having everything exactly where it needs to be is not easy. And, I mean, there's a lot of people in professional wrestling who – Think that they're going to be in, in a matter of weeks. They're going to be in the WWE and that, or, or, or AEW or New Japan Pro Wrestling. That's not the case. You have to pay your dues. You got to put in your time. You have to learn from those that came before you. And I mean, I, I always say, if it weren't for wrestlers like the John Blackhearts, like the uh, Pete Maddens, like guys like Johnny Jet, like the Joe Lancias, like the um Steve Murphy's of the professional wrestling industry uh I wouldn't have learned a hundredth of what I've learned and I mean again you're always learning in wrestling it doesn't matter whether you're an announcer a, a, a referee a wrestler you're always learning and that's one of the things in 35 plus years it's sometimes you gotta take a minute and kind of look back but I gotta tell you it's it's been worth every bit of the ride oh I can totally believe that I mean and the ride you've been on has taken you to so many places, not just, you know, in the state of Missouri, but nationwide. Where to, like, early on in your career, where was probably one of the most unique and just surprising experiences you had as far as different locations outside of the Midwest? <laughs> Well, Jeremy, I got to tell you, there have been some some memorable events that just just here in the St. Louis area alone. I had an opportunity to wrestle in St. Charles in a place called the Horse Palace. And to give you an idea, we wrestled in the middle of a rodeo barn. <laughs> I mean, it was it's one of those experiences. I had one. Uh, we were down in Gray Summit, Missouri, and we were wrestling in a um, a hotel's parking lot. Uh, I've wrestled. Uh, in Fogarty Park in U City, for those that are familiar in the St. Louis area. I had an opportunity uh, to wrestle in a school cafeteria in Chicago. Um, uh, but by the same token, I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of, where we get the, the, the crazy venues, if you will. I've had the opportunity to be in a lot of great venues. I've had an opportunity to be, um, I remember back very early on in my time with Dynamo Pro, having an opportunity to be at the, uh, at Southeast Missouri State. And having an okay. opportunity to be in one of their uh, facilities, and um, the the names that were on that event, uh, people like uh, the Phoenix Twins, uh, a young lady that a lot of people in St. Louis know by the name of Mischief, uh, Amazing Kong, a uh, tag team who a lot of people know today, Matt and Nick Jackson, the Young Bucks. Um, when you sit there and you look at it. Um, that's just one of them had an opportunity to be a part of an event out in Kansas city. And, um, it was, it was a, a great trip and had the opportunity to wrestle, uh, be a part of matches with, uh, wrestlers one right now, uh, Amari Miller from NXT had, I believe one of her last matches before being signed to, uh, the WWE developmental program. Um, like I said, when it comes to pro wrestling, I, I've been there, I've done that, and and I wouldn't trade anything for the world between the the venues and the road trips and and the dinners and the 
the the two o'clock storytelling sessions when you're sitting eating breakfast after a good event. I mean, it's it's really been awesome. I could take I could take a whole show. We got a lot of other great things tonight going on, but I can tell you so many stories about about being in the world of professional wrestling. And I, I know we've had some some comments coming up uh, here on the program already. There are some stories I can share later on that really uh, yeah, that really uh, would surprise people about the world of professional wrestling. Yeah, and I think uh, our good buddy Chris Rodell, the voice of Dynamo Pro Wrestling, has a. Uh has one of his own, wanting me to ask you about the Bama Bodine. Well, Bama Bodine, I got to tell you right now, uh, Bama Bodine was a legendary referee. Um, he was one of those, and and I, I'm just going to be perfectly upfront. He was one of those guys that was about five foot tall. He weighed about 110 pounds. He was known for being a pretty tough guy as a referee and as a person and you hear all the stories from uh in some cases about the old days about guys who can just sit back and they'll be in the corner of the locker room they won't do any cardiovascular conditioning they won't do uh any kind of real physical work but then they can go inside the ring and be in there for an hour right and bama bodine was a referee he was a man's man in every step of the word and i gotta tell you right now um, I really am surprised that when it comes down to it, I always try to tell a lot of the referees, uh, whether it, it's guys like former referee Scott Ramsey or H.D. Daniels or Christopher Miles. I told stories uh, to, to my good friend Jay King and to Michael Crace, referees, about the, the stories about, the, about Bama Bodine. He's a man who was gone far too soon. And again, when I, when I get in there and referee, I think of a lot of the things he said. And I mean, again, that was 20 plus years ago. And I mean, the man, when he told you something, you knew to take it to heart because he wasn't doing it to be mean. He was making sure that you were the best referee you could be. And, and Bamba Bodine hands down was probably, I'd say probably one of the three best referees, if not one of the, if not the best referee I've ever had the opportunity to be in the ring with um, in my wrestling career. And I believe he was, it's actually been about 12 years since Bama Bodine passed away. I think he was only about 53 years old. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that you see far too often in the wrestling industry, untimely um, deaths. And, you know, so transitioning. So here's my thing. What do you think can be done in the wrestling industry today to kind of improve the health and vitality of the wrestlers in it. Because, you know, as a former wrestler yourself, you know the toll it's taken on your body, as mm -hmm. on your brother, and, you know, anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, we always say, like, how the apron at the ringside has no um, no give, but at the same time, there's barely give on those mats in the middle of the ring. You know, I've stepped mm -hmm. inside wrestling rings before, and, yeah, it's not pleasant landing on them. Um, especially back first and you're doing it for 20 something years. Mm -hmm. So what methods do you think there can be to help, you know, kind of a, like type of health care or just type of what method do you think? Because, you know, these wrestlers living to only their fifties, if not er, passing away earlier, it's got to change. Well, well, Jeremy, I mean, again, in professional wrestling, as you've said countless times when we've had discussions, it's a contact sport. I mean, when you look at it, it could be like boxing or football. I mean, it is a or, or hockey. It's a contact sport. And I mean, one of the big things I can I can I have to stress enough is making sure. And this sounds very cliche, but it's the truth. You've got to be in good shape. You can't just walk into a ring and expect to be able to go for 20, 30 minutes. It's not going to happen. You've got to make sure you watch your diet. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, well, I can I can have a cheat day or I can do things along those lines. No, you've got to be able to watch your diet. You've got to go in there. And I mean, again, your body does get conditioned. But it's, it's one of those situations of where, like I said, there's a lot of things you've got to you've got to try to avoid the vices, too. I mean, there's a lot of people and, and you were making reference to it earlier. 
and the idea of, of wrestlers who are, are getting involved in things like medications and alcohol and drugs and things like that. And I can tell you right now, when you look at some of the wrestlers of the past who who were on the road 250, 300, 350 days a year, as, as I, I know you and I have talked about the uh, the documentary 350 Days. Yeah, that was very common for wrestlers in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s to be on the road, as I believe Ric Flair said it, seven days a week and twice on Sundays. Yep, I mean that's uh, that's the way it is, and I mean thankfully right now a lot of wrestlers are taking those things into consideration they're knowing i mean they get afraid of losing their spot but when it comes down to it you've got to be aware of what your body tells you i mean i had an opportunity as a referee i mean i it's really tough because i'm not going to lie to the viewers of the of roundabout sports i'm in my mid 40s and i already know i've had doctors tell me i'm gonna have to have a shoulder rebuilt before 50. i've had countless exams on my knees and my ankles i've had concussions before i mean i know it's a contact sport and things like that are going to happen but the biggest thing is you just have to think smart you can't go rushing into things you have to make sure you're aware of what your body tells you because if you don't you're going to run the risk of causing severe damage to your body and severe damage to other people and that's not what pro wrestling is all about. I mean, again, you have to make sure that you understand that when you get inside a squared circle, it's like the WWE has said for years, bad things can happen. And you just have to be aware of what your body's doing and what your body's capable of because one wrong decision and you could, I mean, I've seen wrestlers in 35 years. I've seen guys, um, I've seen guys blow up ankle or sir. Uh, I remember a gentleman, putting out a leapfrog and blew out his knee. Uh, I've seen guys with cracked orbital sockets. I've seen people with shattered noses. I've seen far too much bloodshed. Um, I've seen broken bones. I've seen broken necks. I've seen, uh, I saw one wrestler who later wound up uh, saying that he had two uh, broken discs in his back. And again, a lot of times it's not necessarily their opponents that's doing it. And it's just, you have to be aware you have to be knowledgeable of what your body can and can't take. What is the worst injury you personally have endured? Even if, because honestly, believe it or not, referees can have injuries too during mm-hmm. matches. But in your career in professional wrestling, whether it be, I'll be it in a wrestler or a referee, what is the worst injury that you you have sustained? Well, actually, I'm gonna be honest with you, Jeremy. I've had three. Two, the two, the two worst, honestly, or two of the worst, were ones where I wasn't even an in-ring competitor. Uh, I'd say the worst I had was I uh, actually aggravated both of the major muscle groups in my back. Uh, I took a fallaway slam. Uh, many people know Razor Ramon was very common for throwing that in the '90s. Uh, my lower back hit the mat. My shoulders never did. And I remember having to spend most of my Thanksgiving dinner laying in my bed. Thankfully, at the time, my my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, was able to help me eat so I could get things taken care of. Because I couldn't even move up and down the stairs for about two, three days afterward. And finally, it started to ease up a little bit. But surprisingly, the two worst were as a referee. I had one where I pulled my abdominal wall. Uh, and needless to say, when I went to the doctor two days later, they told me point blank, we're surprised that you haven't developed sepsis because of all the damage you had done from that matchup. And the other one, I think you were, you were there live. It was in Dynamo Pro Wrestling, as a matter of fact, um, up in Grafton, Illinois. When, Uh... um, I, I did my job and I got met with about 330 pounds of a charging, Big Vic from the Agents of Chaos smashing me into a corner. And it, it, it literally, it was like watching a runaway train coming down the track and you're just looking at it and you're like, it, 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 by then it was too late. And I mean, again, when it comes down to it, I mean, like you said, any little thing can happen. I mean, I, I know that, um, like I said, uh, Chris Rodell's had issues. I know referee Christopher Miles from Dynamo Pro's had issues. Um, it, when it comes down to it, injuries can happen in an instant. And, and again, thankfully, I've 
pretty well recovered from most of them. But again, I still feel them every day. And it's just a part of what you do in the world of professional wrestling. And I know we'll be thankful enough, I believe, in two weeks to have Christopher Miles on the show. Um, I talked to him at the Dynabone Pro Show, and um, he's he was more than gracious to be on. And we've and yeah, referees take bumps just like any other wrestler would, you know. So I think here's a question I don't know if I've actually ever truly asked you. Um, but it is something that's on my mind. So for you personally, because I've talked to a lot of wrestlers about this, what what do you say or what is your reaction if somebody has come up to you in your career? and says, you know that stuff is fake, right? My first reaction is just like the the wrestlers of old. If you think it's real or you think it's fake, you get in the ring and see exactly what's going on because you're fall, you're, you're, you're taking falls on ply where they're like, oh, it's a trampoline. No, it's not, guys. You've got wrestlers that are going out there. They have to condition their bodies. I mean, again, you a lot of people, I also say, do you like watching the UFC or Bellator or Strike Force? And you see that that kind of action pro wrestling isn't really that much different the only difference is they don't have they don't have a cage around the outside of the ring in a lot of cases they still have those those ring ropes that do a very similar thing wrestlers go in that ring and i've had people who've gotten in that ring i've seen 350 pound football players get in that ring and they can't last 10 minutes i've seen people who can run half marathons or more get in that ring 10, 15 minutes, they're done. I I can't tell you how many people I've seen come in. Well, I can be a pro wrestler. They turn around, don't make it through the first night or the first week. Being a wrestler, and not just a pro wrestler, but a wrestler in general. And I, I heard it from a very good friend of mine, which I, I, I feel very fortunate for. To be a wrestler, you have to be mentally, physically, and emotionally prepared. It's not a walk in the park. You have to be able to understand there's going to be times where, to be honest, you may get dropped on your head. You may get thrown around and have absolutely no control where you're going to land. But the fact is, you've got to be able to understand that it's real. I mean, they may say choreographing or predetermined or things like that. Men and women go in there each and every time and they put themselves on the line. And I mean, it's one of them that comes down to, I've seen so many women, men and women who can't make it, but seeing a lot of wrestlers who've made it to places like pro wrestling, Noah, who've made it to ring of honor, who've made it to the NWA, who've made it to AEW, who've made it to the WWE, who've made it to new Japan and seeing what they've had to go through to get there. It's like, it's, it's like Steve Austin said, this isn't real. Try lacing my boots. Yeah, and I think if anybody is a prime example of that, it would be Stone Cold because look what's happened to him. You know, he gets dropped on his head in 97, and, you know, he was a very gifted technical wrestler then and prior to that. He had all kinds of different moves, a very unique arsenal. But when when the pile driver, you know, from the late Owen Hart – you know, got botched and he was basically dropped on his head. It affected his whole nervous system and everything. And as the years wore on, everything just started to degenerate. And he was more of a brawler. He was very limited in what he could do. And, you know, by the time when he was making part-time appearances, all he was doing was just some punches and some kicks. And that's what, and that wasn't part of his character in this. It was, yeah, he was known as the brawler who stomps a mud hole in your ass. But that was the kind of the character part of the real life Steve Austin, who could not do, you know, the big arm drags, or he couldn't do, you know, any type of big time moves. Like even doing something like an axe handle, a double axe handle from the top rope would be hard on him because of the knees and because of how everything just degenerated. And it's not just him. It's, you know, hundreds of wrestlers, you know, if not more have endured so many last, you know, long lasting physical ailments and mental. 
but mm -hmm. physical as well. And, you know, I liken it to when you see all these documentaries on football players. You see all these things. I remember the great, the late, great Johnny Unitas, you know, Hall of Fame football quarterback. He could barely, at the end, near the end of his life, he was interviewed for Sports Illustrated. He could barely, you know, clench his fist. He would be out golfing and he'd have trouble because he, he like, that was one of the only things they could do. His arthritis got so bad from playing football. And you hear guys these days saying, you know, if I could do it over, I wouldn't do this or I'd take better care of myself. And for professional wrestlers, I mean, you can say the same thing because, yeah, okay, say it's predetermined, like they can say, you know, who wins or who loses. But the thing of it is, at the end of the day, the wrestlers go out there and put everything on the line, put basically their lives on the line, their health, everything, whether it be in front of 70 people or thousands of people, just to make sure that those fans who are there are satisfied, you know? Now, imagine doing that, like you said, 200-something days a year, if not 300, and then they have maybe a 20-year career, if not, you know, some some cases more. The amount that you feel on your body physically and mentally and emotionally, everything, it just, it just kills you inside to witness it, but, you know... Me, I've been a wrestling fan since like 2004, 2003, 2004, you know, and I started really watching it around those times. And, you know, my close group of friends, we've been watching it our whole lives practically. And people from the outside would come up to us and be like, yeah, you know, that stuff's fake. You know, why are you watching that? And you know what? I would basically want to have the same reaction you would or, you know, or like Stone Cold would say, because... That is as far from fake as you can get. Like, they've had to change the rules around just to make sure it's safer. You know, kind of like how in the NFL, the helmet the helmets have been eliminated, or at least as far as, you know, actually penalizing it now. Look at professional wrestling, especially in like WWE, for example. Chair shots to the head, other hits to the head, things like that. Certain moves that could lead to head brain damage, you know? So, yeah, I think it's also spitting in the face of all of those who pour their heart and soul out in the industry. Like, hell, lifting, putting together and taking down the ring isn't even fake. Like, you can't fake that. We, You and I have both had parts of that ring drop on our feet before. Mm -hmm. And... They've been bruised. <laughs> and that's one of the things, too, Jeremy. A lot of people don't understand. It's the idea where a lot of these wrestlers are going from town to town. They're competing inside the ring. They're going in there. They're putting in 15, 20 minutes or more in the ring. And then a lot of times they're turning around. They're having to tear things down. They get in the car. They've got the three and the four and the five-hour drives. And I'll tell you, I mean, they're, 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 it's really a double-edged sword because on one hand, you're tired, you're beat up, you're sore. But then you get the opportunity and, and – um, you look at some of the road stories. I remember one uh, several years ago, I had an opportunity to drive central Illinois and it was a very hot day. And um, the end result is I drove with my good friend, Chris Rodell and another friend of mine, a man by the name of Justin, the Iceman Wade. And uh, Justin is a very good friend of mine. Uh, Rodell has been a friend of mine pretty much the majority of my career. And um, we, end of the night, we got our pay and we got ready to drive back home. And we just sat down and we said, hey, we're going to get a quick bite to eat. We're going to get back in the car. We had about a three-hour drive. We're going to take care of things. We wound up sitting in the middle of a Cracker Barrel restaurant for almost three hours just doing nothing but eating and talking and hanging out and, and talking about life. and. <laughs> Things along those lines. And I mean, again, things like that or um, uh, having the opportunity, a uh, good friend of mine, Eric Davis, longtime referee here in the St. Louis area. I remember uh, a lot of professional wrestlers say, oh, they'll do one match a weekend. I remember uh, Eric Davis and I had three events in three days. And 
there were many times where where he and I would spend more time on the road than we would spend with our own families. And it's like I said, they say like it's a brotherhood, it's a family. And there are so many wrestlers that I mean, again, I I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to be around so many great wrestlers and, and seeing people who've gone out there and, and made it to the top and done the best that they can. And it, it's great. And um, I always, I always liken my career to uh, Tom Berenger from me uh, from major league. I've seen the start of so many promising young careers, but it seems like every year I keep learning and it's another year in the sun. And I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Uh, getting the opportunity to see um, referees that are coming through, wrestlers coming through places like the Dynamo Pro Dojo, having the opportunity to um, – and, of course, we talk about referees, and here's Christopher Miles coming yeah, on welcome, here. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> um, but, but the opportunity to have sit in ringside and having the opportunity to uh, share my knowledge with people like uh, – I, I, I had to say it like Richard Douglas and, and like yourself. Um, one of the things I've always learned in the wrestling industry is you got to pay it forward and to have the opportunity to have people learn what the sport of professional wrestling truly is, is one of those things that I really have to say that it, it, it brings me enjoyment. I mean, it comes down to it. There've been so many things I've done in my career, but the opportunity to see the excitement in the wrestlers and the, and the staff and the fans, that was keeps me going. Absolutely. And Luke, you know, I'm going to tell you, you, you are the wealth of stories, the storybook, the encyclopedia when it comes to so much. Um, and, you know, there's always more to tell. You are like the cliffhanger. There's always another story to tell. Um, and I know we have a we have a great show ahead of us. Parker is actually um, hopping on shortly, so I've got to say before I let you go. First off, thank you for everything you've done for me, and not just my career, but in my life. You're a dear friend. You're my confidant. You know, I know. For those that don't know, a lot of times I'll consult with Luke before I do a lot of decision making because he's the one I know that won't steer me the wrong way. You know, like I can truly trust him with where to go and whatnot. Um, and so I know that you'll definitely be back on the show. Oh, times. most definitely. Most definitely. We got, we got plenty to talk about. Oh, um, yeah. you, you know, Jeremy, when it comes to when it comes to pro wrestling, I meaning we only scratched the surface. I know you're probably going to get a whole bunch of comments on here in just a few minutes, but we could start talking hockey. I mean, again, I know you're you're you're, you're wearing your blue shirt, and I'm uh, I'm not going to fit. I've really kind of this season started following the Seattle. Uh, the definitely yeah. been definitely been a a, a a fair season. I won't say it's a great season. They haven't had a season like the uh, like the Golden Knights have uh, early on in in their uh, franchise history. But having the opportunity to talk that, hopefully, talk some baseball. But you know something, Jeremy, the biggest thing is I got to say thank you. To, to just a couple people real quick. Um, I got to say thank you to, to my wife. Um, 35 years of being around pro wrestling. I know I haven't always been the uh, the person who's home all the time. Like they said, I miss birthdays. I miss uh, family get-togethers, things like that. But she's always stood behind me and uh, taking care of things like that. I uh, also want to thank all the, the great promoters that have uh, given me the opportunity not just to be in the ring but to learn. And, and most importantly, I want to thank the fans because, uh, again, pro wrestling doesn't exist without the fans. And whether it's the multi-million dollar companies, and we took, we uh, had an opportunity before we came on the air tonight to talk about the potential new horizon, if you will, with AEW and ROH. And that's another yeah. discussion for another time. But when you look at promotions like that in New Japan Pro Wrestling and the, and the promotions in the, in in Europe and Australia and things along those lines and going all the way down to the promotions like the Dynamo Pros of the world, um, it's one of those the fans are so supportive. They're so receptive. And, and having the opportunity to take pictures and sign autographs, that is probably one of the best feelings in the world. And, again, 
I want to say thank you for having me on tonight. I know we got Parker's going to be on in a few minutes. We got to talk some baseball. I know, uh, like I said, I'm going to be sitting here watching because I want to know when we're going to see the Cubbies come into St. Louis and play some baseball this year. Because, like I said, baseball, like I say, we're getting close. to It should be spring training time. And I understand what everything's going on, but it's baseball time. It's time to get baseball going on in St. Louis. I mean, we're going to be getting close to the hockey postseason. We're going to have baseball. We got to get this stuff going. We absolutely do. Well, Luke, like I said, thank you so much for being on. And I already, you know, I know on the Russell Talk podcast, we always ask, welcome to the family. We already know. We're practically family. <laughs> so cool. I, I saved the trouble of um, having to ask that. Um, but for those that don't know, you can catch Luke Roberts with Dynamo Pro Wrestling. He is not just basically the master of ceremonies. He goes out there and hypes up the crowd to kick us all off. But he's alongside me at the commentary booth. I mean, like I said, I've seen him ref for many years. Um, a lot of great wrestlers that are there today, like Adrian Surge, um, Ben Trust, for example. They consult with you about you know their in-ring work, and you're just that big wealth of advice, a great mentor. So I know I'll probably be talking to you after the show, too. So <laughs> You take care, well, Luke, okay? Hey, well, thank you, Jeremy. And again, a reminder, if there's anybody here in the St. Louis area that wants to go out and have a great night, tomorrow night, Dynamo Pro Wrestling, Ar Arnold Eagles Hall, um, Arnold, Missouri. Uh, I know for a fact I was just getting a message. And again, I don't know why I came from Chris Rodell. Uh, I believe tomorrow night their food special is going to be homemade lasagna. Get the opportunity to have some, some great food. Uh, Dynamo Pro Wrestling. Uh, it's going to be an Arnold, a great night. Make it a point. Uh, check out Dynamo Pro Wrestling on social media. And like I said, I'm going to go ahead and step aside because I know Parker's ready to come on and talk baseball and things along those lines. And you know what? I was just checking out some things here. And when it comes down to it, I know that he wants to talk baseball because he was hoping to start off his start off his next year um, with uh, baseball. But it doesn't sound like it's going to happen. So I'm going to kind of sit back here. And listen in because, like I said, you're going to get great sports news, great sports info, not just in the St. Louis area, but across the state of Missouri and beyond. Interstate 70 Sports Media and Roundabout Sports is the place to catch it. Jeremy, thank you for having me. My pleasure, Luke. Luke Roberts, ladies and gentlemen. I'll talk to you later, my friend. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Not just a, a dear friend, but one of the smartest, most intelligent men you could ever meet. Well, folks. Normally, this is where, you know, we take that little commercial break and everything. But let me just quickly say, you can follow Interstate 70 Sports Media on Facebook, on Twitter. We're on YouTube. As far as Roundabout Sports goes, we're on Facebook as well. You can also find us on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, on Anchor, on Breaker. Hell, there is so many places. Wherever you listen to a podcast, I am Almost certain you're going to find us on there. We're looking to expand every single day. Now, a big part of that is because of this gentleman. A while back, a few months ago, when I had, you know, worked on recruiting more team members, he was one of the first people to jump aboard. And little did I realize how much knowledge he brought with him as well. He's a published author. He is a sports historian, and he has taught me things that, you know, I considered myself a big history buff in general, let alone with sports, but he's taught me enough stuff that even I didn't know. And so I'm really looking forward to having him on. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Roundabout Sports, Parker Bania. Thank you, Jeremy. It's Bina, but that's, Bina, sorry. that's quite all right. Um, Parker Bina, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, as I said, the baseball season was supposed to open on my birthday, but looks like that's not happening. Yeah, and so I James has been on top of all this for the lockouts. So as much as I'm not going to delve into the developments of it, I wanted to ask you this first question. Please. What are your thoughts on Commissioner Rob Manfred and his job so far in Major League Baseball? I think Commissioner Rob Manford needs to go. Yeah, I I've gotten that type of 
comments from a lot of people. We I, I, if we could dig up Happy Chandler and put him back in there, I'd be happy. Right. <laughs> um, the, and the only reason why things like Happy Chandler was only pressured by groups that were very um, influential on baseball at the time, you know, yeah. like his suspension of Leo Durocher. It's not so much that well, he wanted remember to remember Happy it. Chandler also said, hell, if a black boy can make it on Okinawa, he can make it in baseball. Exactly. He was very um, integral to the breaking of the color barrier back in 1947 as well. And he made my grandfather a Kentucky colonel in 1958. No kidding. How about no kidding. that? That's awesome. So, Parker, I want to ask you, so for what got you into your love of sports history? Uh, well, growing up, I, growing up, I was best friends with Burt Sugar's son. And Burt Sugar is probably the foremost authority on sports history I ever knew. Oh, wow. Um, and you just kind of took the ball and went on from there. Well, Bert asked me to do research for him for several books of his. And I, yeah, I basically took the ball and ran with it. <laughs> um, so, for, like I said, um, I, I believe that's a St. Louis Browns hat that you are wearing. No, it is not. It is the is it? road blue St. Louis Cardinals hat that they is wore. Is it the road blue? The, okay. That's the road blue. See, I just they've always been my favorite hats. I don't know why they stopped wearing them. I was gonna say it does look like a really nice hat. Um, well, here is some. So, as you know, there are only four living St. Louis Browns players, former St. Yes. Louis Browns players. Um, have you ever attended any of the luncheons with the historical society or any of their events or gatherings? No, but uh, I went to winter warm up, and he was still living at the time. I met a guy named Chuck Deering who played for the Browns and then moved with the Browns to Baltimore and played for the Orioles for a few years. And he is noted for robbing Mickey Mantle of a few extra base hits with some outstanding plays. He played a very good defensive outfield. Okay. Really interesting. I, while I never had the pleasure, have not had the pleasure yet, I'm still hoping one day I can. While I have not had the pleasure of meeting any former St. Louis Browns players, I actually know um, there's a resident who I work with um, who was um, good friends with, who was like neighbors and best friends with uh, a former player on the St. Louis Browns. And I wish off the top of my head I could figure out what his name was. Um, he was from the St. Louis area. And if I do, at some point, it pops back into my head. I will definitely be able to um, re remember it. Um, so here's my thing. Um, the St. Louis Cardinals announced for the <clears throat> Cardinal Hall of Fame their inductee list or their ballot list. Yes. And only one player of this bunch can be inducted this year. Mm -hmm. And for those that have not heard the list and i'm pretty sure you saw the list already but i'll just say it for those listening at home it is matt holiday matt morris edgar renteria george hendrick steve carlton and out of them who do you feel is most deserving of being inducted this year Matt Holiday. You feel it's Matt Holiday? Um, yes, I do. Because okay. Matt Holiday got here, started putting the numbers up right away, and helped us to do a World Series and a World Championship while he was here. I, Carl, really I would make a case for Carlton, but Carlton didn't really come into his own until after he left St. Louis. I mean, he was good in St. Louis, but he wasn't great the way he was in Philadelphia. Right. And I see, that's the thing. I um, actually had put my opinion out there and said I would go with Steve Carlton first. But it is true that his career was more known for being in Philadelphia. And as somebody uh, pointed out to me earlier in the day, if anything, one of his most notable Cardinals moments was him leaving St. Louis. Actually, one of his more notable car. Cardinal moments was setting a major league record of 19 strikeouts in a game and losing. 
is that a record that still stands? He struck out 19 Mets and lost four to three on a pair oh. of two run homers by Ron Swoboda. Oh my gosh. That see, I, I could not imagine having to go through that. <laughs> um, it's 19 isn't the record anymore, but I think it okay. may still be the record for number of strikeouts in a loss. I was going to say, I'm wondering, because I know it's not the record for in, in a game, but no. I was just wondering if it was the record still for a losing pitcher. I think um, it might be. Okay. Because that would be, that's very hard. That'd be a hard one to top. Because if you strike out 19 batters, I mean, you really got to be, it's, it's really right down there to um, get that. <laughs> um, so... My next question actually is also about pitching. Now, throughout your years of baseball, pitchers used to, before the era of the bullpen really started to come through with the setup men, the middle relievers. Oh, um, Jesus, really don't guys. get me started. Don't get me started. Well, I, I know. <laughs> um, I mean, for example, Bob Gibson, you know, late great Bob Gibson had more complete or had more complete games than he did wins. Yep. And we already know that said something. So did Tom um, Seaver, so did a few of them. Exactly. A lot of the guys from that era had more complete games than they had wins. You know, I mean, that's why I honestly, Cy Young, I believe Cy Young had 749 complete games, you know, and he got 511 wins, but still. Which it says on, which it said on his license plate. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. So here's my thing. And I want to ask you. Please. Does do you feel that the no hitter has lost its luster because of how baseball's pitching has evolved? Yes. Yes, and I think the twenty win season may end up becoming a thing of the past. I mean, you never. I mean, you don't even see a complete game shutout anymore. Nothing. No, I and I love looking at these records. I've always been fascinated with the records that are deemed unbreakable because if for nothing else, ever since Cal Ripken Jr. broke uh, Lou Gehrig's, you know, Iron Man streak, you know, it makes you think what streaks can actually be broken and which ones can't. Like, okay, for example, there's the only record I, I mean, there's a lot I feel can't be, but I know for sure statistically one that will never be broken is the Cleveland Spiders 134 losses, and it's or the I'm sorry the 101 road losses in that season. Yeah, well, you cannot you cannot do that because there's only 81 road games in a season, so it's physically impossible for them to for a team to lose that many. Team can still lose over 130 some games, but you just kind of hope they don't. You can't lose 101 of them on the road anymore. No, no, you can't. I mean, there's other records like. Walter Johnson's 110 shutouts. Walter Johnson won. Walter Johnson won 416 games in his career, and one quarter of those wins were shutouts. Yeah. Or over one quarter of those wins were shutouts. What do you feel is the most, as far as ones that can technically be broken? What record do you think? Is the most is the least likely to ever happen? Bob Gibson's one point one two ERA, nineteen sixty eight. Okay. That that. Well, there's another one. There's another one that nobody knows about. Well, hardly anybody okay. knows about. Hoss Radburn, eighteen eighty four, sixty wins. What? Yep. 60 Hoss wins. Brett, 60 and 12 with a 1.73 complete games. Now, now, ERA under two. And what seventy <laughs> innings and 400 and some odd strikeouts. I mean, granted, the rules were different, different then, but, you know, stats and statistics don't lie. No. 60. Holy crap, 60 wins? No, 60 wins. I never heard of that one before in my entire life. That just completely 
blew my mind. So well, let me tell you something else. The first ever major league baseball no hitter. I mean, there were some in the National Association from 1871 to 1875, but the National Association is not considered a major league. The right. first ever major league no hitter was was thrown in St. Louis. Okay. Interesting. It was thrown by a, it was thrown on this, on July 15th, 1876, 11 days after the United States turned 100. About uh. 3 weeks after Custer met his doom at Little Bighorn. It was thrown by a gentleman named George Washington Bradley. And he beat the Hartford Dark Blues 2 to nothing. Okay. Wow. Now, do you think? Now, you said the um, the, the National Association. Uh, yeah, it was from eighteen seventy. The national, it, its official name was the National Association of Baseball. Two words: baseball players. Okay. It was disbanded after the eighteen seventy five season, and in eighteen seventy six, the National League that we know today was created. Okay. And here's and you had mentioned that the that Major League ba Baseball does not officially recognize them. No, no. Do you think they should? Yeah, I do because you know you get paid to play. That's Major League. Okay. Uh, they do, however, recognize the American Association that existed from 1882 to the end of the 1891 season. And it was known as the Beer and Whiskey League because most of the original ownership groups had ties to the brewing and distilling industries. And one of the charter franchises was the St. Louis Brown Stockings. Not to be confused with the St. Louis Browns of the American League. Right. The St. Louis Brown Stockings eventually, they were actually the flagship franchise of the Beer and Whiskey League. They won four straight pennants from 1885 to 1888 and won World's Championship in 1886. They participated with the pennant winners of the National League in a postseason series called the World's apostrophe S series, and they competed for the World's Championship. Wow! So, yes, you can you can art now. All right, the St. Louis Browns franchise eventually morphed into the Cardinals franchise that we know and love today. Right. Yeah, there were four franchises from the American Association that eventually joined the National League. The Cincinnati Reds, the Pittsburgh Alleghenies, which eventually became the Pirates, and the Brooklyn, they were known at various times as the Excelsiors, Atlantics, Broad, Bridegrooms, Superbas, Robins, etc., 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 before finally settling on Dodgers. So the Los Angeles dot. So the, the Cincinnati Reds, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Los Angeles Dodgers, and our beloved St. Louis Cardinals are the four surviving franchises of the American Association that are still in operation today. We have a little bit of time. Wow. Now, that is a lineage right there. Yes, it is. And, you know, you see a lot of people walking around with clothing that says St. Louis Cardinals established 18, 1892. Right. That is incorrect. Mm -hmm. That nine should be an eight. That I did know. And um, that was that was one of the interesting things when you had asked a bunch of us on the team at I-70 Sports about that. And I got and I was like, wow, I actually remember that one. But the history behind it, you know, you delved into more details than I could have thought of. So feel free to kind of share about yeah. that. Okay, the St. Louis Cardinals that we know and love today were not founded in St. Louis. They were founded on November 2nd, 1881 at the Hotel Gibson in Cincinnati. The, the American Association held its initial meeting, and 
The owner of the St. Louis franchise, Chris von der A, a German-born beer baron, was elected chairman of the meeting. Wow. Now, okay. if you look at baseballreference.com, you notice our record, our lifetime wins and losses. We are over 11,000 wins and losses or wins. Right. Now, there was a movement... We had gotten our 10,000th win. I'm trying to think it was about seven or eight years ago. And somebody said that the wins we accumulated in the American Association needed to be discount discounted because they didn't feel the American Association was major league. However, according to John Thorne, the official historian of Major League Baseball, the American Association is Major League. As a matter of fact, the first ever triple crown winner for the St. Louis for the St. Louis franchise was a gentleman named Tip O'Neill, who was the original Canadian crusher. People are calling Tyler O'Neill the Canadian crusher. There was a Canadian crusher about 140 years before him. <laughs> 1887, he hit. He led the league in homers, RBIs, doubles, triples, slugging percentage, on-base percentage, even though some of those weren't official stats yet, right. and batting average. And That's more than just a triple crown then. <laughs> well, but, <laughs> but get this. He batted 492. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Not so fast. Okay. Um, well, there was a in 1887, the year he did this, there was a kind of a quirky rule established that counted walks as base hits. Oh. Okay. And his hit total was elevated from 225 to 275. However, mm -hmm. the following year, the rule was struck down because people. People were saying, oh, there's been there's too many 400 hitters in this league. We got to do something. So they struck the rule down, and O'Neill's batting average was adjusted to 435, which has been the accepted figure by Major League Baseball ever since. And the following year, 1888, he batted 100 points lower, 335 and still managed to lead the league in hitting. So he repeated in 1887 and 1888 as batting champion. Wow. And so he, and basically, so he was still the top perennial guy, even after they had taken away that walks equals base hit statistic. That's correct. But he was, I mean, we, we had the Cardinals, well, the Brown stock, because they weren't known as the Cardinals until 1900. And that's that's another story. Um, they had a real powerhouse lineup. I mean, you didn't have the home run then because you had the dead ball. I mean, they had Charlie Comiskey at first base. They had O'Neill and left. I mean, they, it was they Arlie Latham playing third. Arlie Latham was the original base burglar before Lou Brock. He was <laughs> our stolen base. He was our stolen base leader. We had. A pitching staff that averaged between three guys averaged 30 wins. Yeah, Jumbo McGinnis, Silver King, and Bob and Parisian Bob Carruthers. He is called Parisian Bob because he spent an off season holding out in Paris, France. Okay. Uh, we had, I mean. They didn't have pitch counts. They didn't have bullpens. They didn't have setup men. They didn't have any of that garbage. You pitched. You pitched until you couldn't pitch no more. You pitched until basically your arm fell off. I mean, and what do you? And what do you feel is the reason for the expanded use of the bullpen? Because for so long, you know, the starters, like we had talked about earlier, starters going deep into games was the go-to form, the dominant way of baseball. I mean, mm -hmm. you would be – if you – now, you may see a guy go out back then in the eighth inning or something, you know, but other than that, you know, there – you would be the pitcher. 
Mm -hmm. Unless you and you know, I'd say unless you got hurt, but at the same time, Gibson broke his leg and he still pitched. So yeah, he stayed I, in that game like two more innings, didn't he? Yeah, he stayed in two more innings after he literally broke his after leg. Le Roberto Clem uh, Roberto Clemente line drive literally broke his leg. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so and I think that's one of the many reasons he's considered such an intimidating pitcher like because look if you can't get him out of the game after breaking his leg what the heck are you gonna do you know like there's nothing so what do you feel kind of just brought up the rise of using bullpen relievers i don't know i don't know exactly when it started but i think i kind of know why because you know these these owners invest all this money in pitchers they they just want to baby them they don't want to let them pitch they just coddle them and treat them like babies. No, 100 pitches up, you're gone. Too bad. But I got a no-hitter going, too bad, you're out. And then sometimes what happens, that team ends up losing the game because the bullpen can't get the job done. Exactly. And nope. he, I see now pitch counts are not something – this is how I look at it. If you got a no-hitter going into the ninth, you're staying – in my opinion, you're, you're staying you're sta – I'm staying staying in because why would you not want to stay in? Like a no hitter, especially these days, that's pretty much lost its luster but gained significance because, you know, yeah, we saw it a lot in this past season, but it's not something that happens, you know, all too often because of pitchers coming out of the game early. And so I'm saying if you're in the ninth inning and you're at 95 pitches, for example, yeah, if you're feeling it, Man. go out there. Stay in go there. We ain't going to complain. Like, and if you, you know, and only if you allow if that no hitter is broken up, then it's like, okay, we'll take you out. You did great. It's okay. No harm, no foul. But I'll tell you what, one of the, one of the best pitches, one of the best games I saw Adam Wainwright pitch this year was against the Phillies. He pitched a complete game. But he lost. But I still think that was one of the best games oh, he played. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he stayed in. They didn't take him out. They just left him in there. Yeah, I and remember gets that credit for, He gets credit for a complete game, even though he lost. Yep, and that's something that we really don't see in baseball these days. And that is, you know, a pitcher getting credit for a loss at the same time as getting a complete game. Because mm -hmm. they're not – by that, usually – you know, they're not going to keep him in long enough for that type of thing to happen. And for Wainwright to do it at 39 years old, you know. Yeah, hey, he was going to be turning 40 in like two weeks. Right. And whenever the heck baseball starts, um, you know. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm thinking the 140-game season. A lot of people have said, in their opinion, you know, the over-under is about 140. Yeah. Which is not terrible. I, no. you know, I would be fine with that. I, you know, the way I look at it, I'd much rather have a 140-game season than, than no, season. no season. Or even... I mean, the, it's going to mess a lot of guys up going for career milestones, but... Yes. I think, and I think this also, and I was talking with James about this, and I want your thoughts on this. How do you feel a shortened season, albeit however many games, will affect the decisions of Wainwright and Molina? No, I think Molina has said one more year no matter what. I think Wainwright is leaning that way. I understand they've uh, – I, I understand they've – the National League is going to have the DH. I, I wouldn't mind seeing Albert – back here for one more one last two raw but you know is it really gonna happen you know it's a very slippery slope i feel i would look i think it would be true like baseball justice to have yadi wainwright and pujols on the retiring same team, together on the same team at the same time retiring together just set set three legs off into the sunset. Yes. And, you know, it is that is, and that's one thing about baseball that I love. I feel like some of the best send offs in sports happen in baseball. 
Mariana Rivera's send off. Mm-hmm. Um, holiday send off, even. I mean, the guy I yeah. was there during the last series. He was in. Like I was out there when he went um, around the outfield in the field and gave everybody a standing, or they gave him a standing. And he hit a shot. home run in his final game as a Cardinal. Right, and then he hit the home run in his final game. So I mean, and Babe, Babe Ruth send off was not. You know, the three homers at Forbes Field. I mean, it was great, but it wasn't his final send off, unfortunately. Right. His final his final send off was a meek ground out in Philadelphia. Yeah, there there comes that. In, I mean, and then even like Willie McGee's send off in St. Louis wasn't a good night. I think he finished over three that night and yeah. into a double play. But at the same time, you know, he was so he's so beloved. I mean, they gave him this, the curtain call and everything. Unfortunately, I saw a game. I was at a game in 1999. It was August 5th against the Padres. Mark McGuire hit his 500th and his 501st. And later in the game, Willie McGee made an absolutely fantastic. I know where you're going. No, he was an absolutely fantastic shoestring catch. <laughs> and he got booed. I know why. Do you? I know exactly why. Because that would have been Tony Gwynn's 3,000th hit. That is correct. (laughs) And I, yeah, that that I did know. Um, And, yeah, it's so funny to think that you actually could have a 500th home run and a 3,000th hit in the same game. It Um, almost happened. It it almost happened. About two inches from happening. (laughs) I And, yeah, that's the one time, you know, if he, if he had just gotten a late jump. Just a late jump or, you know, l- put out the glove a little bit to the left or something. You know, no yeah. biggie, no harm, no foul. It would have been fine. Like, But that's one thing about Cardinal fans. Cardinal fans cheer accomplishments. I mean, if a guy is going for a milestone and he's on the other team, they'll cheer him. I mean, Tom Seaver threw a no-hitter for Cincinnati against St. Louis. They cheered him. Albert Pujols hit a home run for the Angels in Bush. They cheered him. They went wild. <laughs> but that's, you know, I think I seem to remember that Ken Griffey Jr. hit his 500th mm-hmm. at Bush. On Father's Day. Yeah, and they cheered him. Because that's yep. that's the kind of fans the Cardinal baseball, that Cardinal fan, that's the kind of fans Cardinal fans are. The, um, what was I going to say? You know, why are they called the Cardinals? Does anybody know the answer to that question? It has nothing whatsoever to do with the princes of the Roman Catholic Church. It has nothing, although St. Louis is a very religious city. It is named after King Louis IX of France, who became, was canonized St. Louis, or St. Louis, but St. Louis. It, uh, it has nothing to do with the bird. It was because the daughter of the owner remarked that the team's new socks were a lovely shade of cardinal. Of cardinal red. Yeah, 1900 season, they got new socks. With, you know, you know, red socks with the white stirrups. And she said, well, oh, what a lovely shade of cardinal. And she ended up becoming the owner of the team once her uncle died. Her name was uh, Helene... Rob Robeson Britain, and she was actually the first female owner of a major league sports franchise in North America. And she owned the team from 1911 until 1917. She sold the team to a transplanted New York car dealer named Sam Breeden, and uh-huh. Sam, Sam Breeden. and Sam Breeden's partner was none other than Branch Rickey. And you know, Branch, Branch Ricky is actually responsible for the birds on the bat logo. That I also um, I knew, but you you've done a lot of series on I seventy Sports Media, and one of them talks about you know, in your opinion, the top executives in Cardinals history. Mm-hmm. I haven't and gotten Branch, to number one yet. You haven't gotten to number one, but um, I know that. One of the guys on that list is um, Branch Rickey. Yes. He's, he actually comes in at number two. 
Mm-hmm. So for those that haven't, first off, I recommend anybody who hasn't read it to read it, but um, especially since, you know, we haven't mentioned three, four, five, and you haven't written one yet. Um, but why, why is Branch Rickey, in your opinion, so influential to not just baseball, but to the Cardinals organization? Because Branch Rickey created what is known today In the 1920s, he created the Cardinal Way. Rather than going out and paying for a bunch of overpriced talent, some of whom may be has-beens and had their best years behind them, he was the first guy to really seriously implement implement player development, home-growing your own talent. He was the developer of the modern farm system. I mean, his influence is felt is still felt throughout baseball. I mean, yes, he signed Jackie Robinson. Yes, he signed Roberto Clemente. Those things are great. Don't get me wrong. But Branch Rickey was influencing the game long before that. Do you consider? Um, do you consider the impact of the farm system to be his greatest accomplishment? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because you're he established the first system for player development. I mean, I mean that's the it's it was the system that George Kissel used for all those years. It, it's the system the Cardinals still use today. I mean, that's how John Mazalak got started. He was he was player development director under Walt Jockety. And another guy who's on that list as well. Um, both of them are. Yeah, both, both of them. But I'll tell and, you another, another, another influential Cardinal executive who was also on this list is Bing Devine. I mean, Bing Devine was very progressive when it came to signing black and Latino players. I mean. The Yankees were the Yankees did not sign their first black player until 1955, Elston Howard. But the Cardinals had signed a guy named Tom Alston a year before that. But I mean, even though the Cardinals were a bit kind of late in the game, they they made progress very quickly. I mean, look at some of the Cardinal stars in the 60s. You had Julian Javier, you had Lou Brock, you had Kurt Flood, you had Julio Gotai, you had Bill White, you had Bob Gibson. I mean, for a year or two, you had Al Jackson, who used to pitch for the Mets. He pitched for the Cardinals for a couple of years. But the Cardinals were made a lot, made very quick progress when it came to signing black and Latino players. And Bing Devine was the reason why. And Bing Devine, and you know, those Cardinal teams of the '60s were some of the best. In franchise history, and I but think they're going to be in our tournament too, aren't they? Yes, yes. For those that don't know, on Interstate 70 Sports Media, in fact, I'm finishing up the second half of the bracket tonight. We are doing now every year we do I 70 Sports Madness. The first year we did this, we had determined we had the fans, you the fans, determine what was the greatest Missouri sports moment, and I believe that w- the one that won was the David Freeze walk-off home run in Game 6 of the 2011 World Series. Um, I believe the runner-up was the Blues winning the Stanley Cup in 2019. Um, I'm surprised that didn't win. Yeah, and I think it was actually a pretty close vote. Um, last year, we had, and this was honestly one of my favorites, we had a matchup of who was the greatest Missouri athlete. Um, and the final two, and we split it up. We made sure we would have a representative from, you know, half of Missouri. And then now did they have to be native born Missourians or did they have to just make their mark in Missouri? They have to make their mark in Missouri. They don't have to be native born Missourians, but a lot of them were a lot of the musical wasn't right. Stan musical wasn't Stan musical did win the vote over a guy who also wasn't born in Missouri. Um, George Brett. Um, yeah, he was born in West Virginia. That's right. Right. And so, but I think it was the perfect final matchup because honestly, you know, George Brett to me is the greatest athlete in Kansas City history. 
Um, you know, definitely the greatest in Royals history. Agreed. Um, and Stan Musial, you know, there's so many things. I mean, to me, he's the greatest Cardinal of all time, but there's so many others you could put up there. And we did have, we had Lou Brock, we had Pujols, Molina, Gibson, but then we had guys like Marshall Falk, Kurt Warner, Orlando Pace, Al McKinnis, yeah. Brett Hole. Um, because he wasn't on we the team. We had long, Wayne Gretzky for a time. We, you know, the thing of it is, because he did not make his mark, we didn't put him on there, but definitely people did ask about him. And I was like, you know, if it just worked out, if Mike Keenan just wasn't the way he was, and things worked out better. Yeah, he's he his greatest years were in Edmonton. Yes, absolutely. And, um, but no. And, you know, of course, we had guys like Will Shields. Hell, we even had Patrick Mahomes for the Kansas City one because he's already great. Um, but this year, I'm going to get back on to what we're doing this year. And this one's really interesting. We are doing the greatest team, the greatest sports team in Missouri history. And so we're going to take 64 teams, 32 from like the St. Louis, from basically the eastern half of Missouri, and 32 from the western half. And we're including got teams from Mizzou and whatnot in there as well. Um, yeah, I didn't see the 9091 Tiger basketball in there. Does it, weren't they like number one in the country for a few weeks? Yeah, they, I'm going to probably put them like on the Kansas City one as well. I'm going to try to have some on the eastern side and some on the western side. Um, but see, yeah. I'm in Jefferson, I'm in Jefferson City, so I'm like perfectly positioned right I was between say, And see, that's what's great is that you have right in the middle, you have some great teams in mind. And so, but yes, um, starting no, there's tomorrow, some Jeff City, there are some Jeff City high school teams you could probably put on that list. <laughs> there, oh my god, I could put CBC high school on, on that list. We can make a turn, yeah. You don't want to go, you don't want to go too far, right? Um, and but anyway, we're going to start this tournament tomorrow, March 4th, um, okay. um, and yeah, we're going to we're gonna have you, the fans, determine, and of course, all of us at the I-70 Sports team are going to have our own opinions as well as to who we okay. think um, the greatest sports team in Missouri sports history is. So, Parker, I want to ask you, in your opinion, in all of you know your years of studying the game, loving the game, watching the game... You know, who do you think would be the greatest team in Missouri sports history? 42 Cardinals. 106 okay. wins. Can't beat that. And they've come close, but they have not yet beat that. No, 04 came, 04 came 04 within came one. 04 came close. Yeah, 04 came close. So five. 105. Yeah. Um, you know, I did not put the 2006 World Series Cardinals on there. I'm putting that out there for the fans. And they may say, oh, but they won the World Series. But yeah, they, but weren't, they, went, they weren't that great in the regular season. They no, were only they went 83 and 70, like eight or 79. Eight. 83 yeah, 78. and 78. Yeah. So I, was remember, like, I think that was the worst ever percentage for a World Series winner. Yes, I believe so. It was for the winner because I know it was the second worst for a team in the World Series. Yeah, the but 73 was, Mets were the worst, percentage-wise. Yes. And but yeah, the Mets right. almost pulled it off. Right. They were and they were close. But yes, I um the 70, or I'm sorry, the 2006 Cardinals won't be on there. Um, but yes, when we get the full list out, we're gonna get the full bracket. And, and the eleven Cardinals should be on there. They yeah, I don't know if you have the eleven the eleven the Cardinals, Cardinals are on there because they're a season that it's just unbelievable in so many different ways. And they still won 90 games. Like they won exactly they won 90. 90. They won right exactly 90. They won and they won plenty of them at the right time. Um well, and, this past year this past year's team did that. They won a lot of games at the right time. They got hot at the right time, but unfortunately in the in the playoff in the play-in game they fizzled. Yeah, they that was a – they really should have. That was rough all around. And I, um, so I, oh, we got some company coming. Hey, hey Kawhi, <laughs> hang on. I don't know why she uh, decided to pop oh. in, but this was is, that a special this, guest. This is our special guest, Kawhi, our amazing cat over here. The tuxedo cat. The tuxedo cat, our sweetheart. Um, <laughs> but yes, I, you know what? I was going to go with either the, 
42 Cardinals, or I was actually thinking the uh, 44 Cardinals, too. Either one of them were my pick. Um, 42 Cardinals won 100. Only all St. Louis World Series. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true, too. The only all. And up until just two years ago, that was the only World Series that was played, or the last World Series that was played in just one city. That's in just one ballpark. Or just one ballpark, yeah. Until the you know the COVID pandemic and everything forced them to play. I mean, you had the two thousand World Series played in one city, but it was right. still played in two ballparks. Yeah, I. Yeah, the forty four series right. was the last played in the same ballpark, all six games. Right, and now I want your opinion on that one for a second. So you you know the reason the forty four Browns were. A lot of people say the reason they were good was also because a lot of the top players on the other teams were in World War II, whereas a lot of guys that were on the Browns were ones that weren't cleared to be in the military, that were declared unfit or something, and so they were still able to thrive. Um, right. I mean, that is why. I, I, I feel that the war time, war, World War II depleted a lot of the rosters. The St. Louis Cardinals – didn't send a lot of their players to world to the war until later in the war. Stan Musial didn't join the Navy until 19 till 1945. Right. Um, because I remember he was on that world series. I believe Marty Marion was also on that team. Yeah. yeah. You know, with, and Red Shandies was still on that team. No, Red and, Shandies was serving. Oh, Red Shandies was serving. Okay. Yes. Um, Red Shandies was serving. Um, I don't. I don't. I think both Cooper brothers were still in. Were still stateside. Okay. John uh, Mize was. John Mize was serving. But you know, um, the St. Louis Browns almost became the Los Angeles Browns. And the St. Louis Cardinals almost became the what, the San Antonio or the Houston. No, I think it was Cardinals. the Milwaukee. <laughs> They were well. I, I Houston and Milwaukee were the candidates for St. Louis, right? Back in '53, and when, that before Anheuser Busch bought the team, right? And what's interesting is in the '80s, the Blues almost moved to Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and Saskatoon. Saskatoon. It's just like, uh, <clears throat> boy, the Rams were so lucky as to where they almost left, but they didn't leave. And now oh. they they, all, they did leave. Now they're back, back in yeah they're back and, in Los Angeles. They can stay there, right? And you know what? One quick side note on that: everybody says that they're back where they originally were from. That the Rams were not from Los Angeles originally. No, they right? weren't. They were from Cleveland. Exactly, they were from Cleveland, and they won a championship there too. Exactly, and it just drives me nuts. I don't know why I get. Maybe it's because I'm a Cleveland Browns fan, so just hearing. Oh like, no. I know. Maybe it's just hearing that just gets under my skin, but it's like that is not where the Rams were originally from. They were no, from they Cleveland. Weren't. Um their owner no. was a guy named Dan Reeves. Yeah. Now here is not that Dan Reeves. <laughs> here here's a question for you. So for the greatest um Missouri sports teams tournament, what is a team that you feel is a lot better than people might think? think one that a lot of very under the radar teams 75 football cardinals okay 11 75. and three it was there was one st louis football cardinals team that finished 11 and three won the division don and don coriel was the coach yep that was either let me see i believe it was either 75 or 74 i do have a couple cardinals um on there and yeah, you know what's interesting? They actually scored uh oh, what was it? Three hundred and fifty-six points that yeah. year. And they won yeah, it was eleven and three. But you know what? This was the last season until nineteen ninety eight that they had made the playoffs. Yeah, they fit no, during a full season. During a full season. I was they gonna made say they the made strike. the playoffs in the eighty two strike shortened year. Right. They were five and four. No, yeah. they were five and four, four and five, something like that. They made the playoffs in that crazy strike format. 
But they had ten or they had nine Pro Bowlers in that year and against in the seventy five season. Yep, they had Jim um, Hart, they had Terry Metcalf, they had Roy Green. Um, so these were their Pro Bowlers actually. They had Tom Banks, Con Conrad Dobler. Conrad Dobler, yep. Yeah. Um, Deerdorf, so Dan Deerdorf, everybody knows Dan Deerdorf, Jim Hart, Terry Metcalf, Jim Otis, Mel Gray. Another running back. Yeah. Yeah, I think Jim, Jim, Otis ran for a Jim Otis ran for a thousand yards that year, I think. Whew. Three running backs on the same team making the Pro Bowl. Now that is something you're not going to find these well, days. You never go see that again. Yeah, no. I mean, and then you got the, then you got Roger Worley, Hall of Famer, and then you Mizzou. got... Mizzou. Roger Where, Mizzou, he was on the list last year's tournament, and then you got um Jim Backen, the kicker. Jim Bakken, seven field Bakken. Goal, seven field goals in the game. Yeah, because that was this is the cardiac cards right here, you know. Seven, That's still the record. Eight of their games were decided in the final minute, and they went seven and one in those games. Yeah. So yeah, I'm. It's just amazing to me that team, and yeah, it's unfortunate. That they lost the divisional playoffs of and shit, of course, against the Rams. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a great team. I believe I actually did put them on the list as well. So they oh, are nice. there. Um, I put a couple on there. It's just the football Cardinals were just a team that had a lot of great players, but just bad manage ownership. Um, Big Divine even ran them for a time. <laughs> Was that and that was what in the early years, I believe? No, it was in the it was in the eighties. Oh, as a matter, of fact, okay. as a matter of fact, he he tried to coax a receiver from Michigan State to switch from baseball back to football. Oh man! And the receiver's name was Kurt Gibson. Oh my gosh! Now I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, that Kurt, yeah, that Kurt Gibson. That Kurt Gibson. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, uh, Parker, I got know. one last. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I got just a couple more questions um, that I want to ask you. So, say you were doing the the other two I 70 Sports Madness tournaments in the past, mm -hmm. who would you have had as the greatest moment and the greatest athlete? Ah, uh, I probably would have chosen the David Freeze walk-off home run, and I would have chosen Bob Gibson as the greatest athlete. Because remember, okay. Bob Gibson was a Harlem Globetrotter. That is true. He, he was a basketball did. player at Creighton. So I would have chosen him as greatest athlete. And that, and I'm trying, and I somewhere I have these the the brackets still. And, you know, because technically they're all still on the media page, but you just have to delve down through all the other. Yeah, you have to scroll down to like. Scroll down for if you have yourself a day or so, because we keep you all yeah. posted. Um, but, yeah, this is a tournament I'm very much excited for, and I know you have a lot of teams in mind. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what team in the Kansas City area do you feel – or in the Mizzou area, slash Kansas City and all that. Basically, the western half of Missouri. Do you okay, feel... Okay, for the Royals, I would probably pick the... I would probably pick the 85 Royals. I mean, I know they beat the Cardinals in the World Series, but they were a good team that year. They were a good young team that year. Very much so. I mean, I know it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths and with... Dinkinger and Todd Worrell. I mean, yes, order was out, but you know, it was nineteen eighty. It was nineteen eighty five. <laughs> this is two thousand twenty two, and I would exactly. still, I would, I would also give consideration to that nineteen ninety ninety one Mizzou basketball team. I mean that that was the one that uh, Steve Stepanovich was on. John John Sundival or. He was on that team, I think. Okay. I think well, Norm Park. Stewart. I think Norm Stewart was still the coach. You should do a coaches bracket. That honestly might be next year. Greatest um, coaches slash managers. 
in Missouri history. And honestly, we would include a lot of the guys that you've actually covered. So yeah, Don Ferro would be in there. Mizzou, Mizzou head coach. I don't know about Dan. Dan Devine might be in there. Anyway, but anyway, go on. Give me one second. All right. It's been a long day. My throat's giving out on me. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. Um, so where can people find you on social media? Cause, cause I have a Facebook more. page. I have a Facebook have page. Facebook. Yep. You can find um, me on Facebook. <laughs> I have a Twitter account, but I don't really use it that much because I can't keep up with it. But yeah, my Facebook page is where you can find me, and I do the and I do my uh, my episodes from my I do my episodes from my blog on WordPress. So that's where you can find me. just look me up on Facebook. <coughs> I see you talking, but I don't hear you talking. Oh, there you go. And you can find <laughs> us. You, you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you just fine. All right. Well, you can find us stuff here at Interstate 70 Sports Media. Parker, it's been just a pleasure having you on this evening. Oh, it's been great. I've and enjoyed it immensely. I, I know I'll have you on again soon, buddy. So Yeah, I'd, I like to do a, I'd like to do a Kansas City version of this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We can easily do a Kansas City version sometime in the future. We All definitely right, will. The, because well, look at the people. Look at the people who's – Careers started in Kansas City. I mean, Mickey Mantle, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. Reggie, Re Reggie got Reggie got his first taste of the show in Kansas City. Absolutely. Catfish, Catfish, Bert Campanaris. Catfish Jim Hunter with the Athletics, right? Bert Campanaris. I mean, but yeah, we could do a Kansas. City. I mean, Garo Yepremian broke a bunch of Chief fans, Chiefs fans' hearts in. Municipal Stadium on December 25th, 1971. Ooh. <laughs> Very much so. Well, Parker, once again, like you, like I said, thank you so much for being on. Oh, it's been great. having you on again, okay? I've enjoyed Parker it immensely. Media, ladies and gentlemen, from I-70 Sports Media. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, my it was friend. A Have a good night. Whew. What an amazing guest, an amazing guy. He knows so much, and I'm looking forward to when he's on again so we can actually talk about Kansas City sports and the history behind all that. I apologize, folks. My voice is kind of getting worn out, you know, <clears throat> making so many podcasts, doing so many interviews. It <clears throat> It's kind of taking its toll. Um, but you know what? The sh we'll be back next week for sure. But that's not how I'm going to end it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to let you all know, as always, at the bottom of the screen, it's the National Suicide Hotline, 1-800-273-8255, 24-7-365. Just know you're never alone. There's always someone out there that loves you. I love you, and you're always important and special to me. I'd like to thank Luke Roberts and Parker Binia for being on, my sh on the show. They're just fantastic. The special thank you to James Knox for picking up my Slack last night and going above and beyond and doing all the amazing reporting he does. And so once again, dad, happy birthday. And just remember everybody life's a book full of empty pages, just waiting to be written in. Make your lives worth reading. I'm Jeremy Carp. Have a good night.